little weird. All there right. Go. Good evening, folks. This is another episode of Rendezvous with Rico. And tonight I have with me a uh, professor of history at Troy University. Uh, is, that, is this what I would pronounce like Dothan Campus? Dothan? Yeah, yeah, I'm down at the Dothan Campus. Dothan oh, Campus. Uh, Marty Outlaw. Mo Marty Olive. Sorry. I that's I all right. I read that wrong. That's Anywho, right. I'm your host, Rico. Y'all know what, I, what this is about. I'm fundraising for the, my local Habitat for Humanities, the Neighborhood Good. Revitalization Committee. Links in the description below on how to do all that. And Marty, would you be so kind to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, uh, my name is Marty Olaf. Uh, uh, like, like Rico said, I'm a, a professor of history, uh, U.S. early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, uh, history, historical methods is uh, what I really primarily oh. teach. And um, I'm here at uh, uh, Troy University Dothan campus, which is in the deep southeast corner of Alabama uh, in a region called the Wiregrass. Uh, this is only important because I'm also the director of the Wiregrass archives, which until Ooh. recently, until recently was the only professionally staffed archives in a 50 mile radius of Southwest uh, Georgia, Southeast Alabama and North Florida. Uh, you know, now we have a couple of other archives in the area uh, about 65 miles away, but, um, but we're it for this, uh, for this corner of, of little corner of heaven, you might say. Yeah. Um, so I'd... that's, that's my introduction, unless you want me to go into some background. Oh no! I just like want to. It's first you know, get some background, like you, you know, you who you are, how you, how you, you know, came to be where you're at now. You know why, why you do sure. what you do. Well, you know, I um, I, I went like like almost all all little kids. I went straight through, um, elementary school, junior high, high school, um finished college in three years because I ran out of money and there weren't grants way back then. If you look at me, you can tell that uh, I'm a little older than, uh, than, than Pell Grants. And, um, <laughs> uh, and I was in college in the 70s, went straight into my master's, spent three years there too, and then decided I'd done nothing but school forever. And so I, I taught school for a semester, and then completely left the southeast, went to Oregon. I say that I was in Oregon from um, from right before St. Helens to right before Bill Clinton's election. <laughs> and when I was 37 years old, I, I realized that um, I needed to get on the pencil end of a job because I couldn't put my feet on the floor. And my wife said, I'm so sick of listening to you wanting to get a a, a doctoral degree. Let's just go get it. So we came back. I blame her. We came back to um, to Alabama. She's from Oregon. She had terrible culture shock. Still has culture shock. We've been here since 1992. I came back to Alabama and with with her and our youngest daughter, and um, uh, went back into uh, uh, Auburn University to um, uh, to work on my doctorate. Got that in '98. Worked. Worked on faculty at Auburn from '96 to 2002, and then came down to, uh, uh, to Troy Dothan to open the Wiregrass Archives and to teach history and archival methods. Um, Wait, you opened the archive, the the Wiregrass yeah. Archives? Yeah, yeah, I'm the founding director of it. Ha ha! Damn. Yeah. Well, and and I do have to to give the library and the history department and uh, the the uh, my staff one of whom is still here. This was in 2002. Um, my staff, the credit that they're due, they had already begun amassing documents. And our archives, uh, Wiregrass Archives, is founded on the congressional office papers of uh, Representative Terry Everett from AL2. And he's he, he doesn't even live that far from here. He lives about five miles from the campus uh, down the road. So in 1999, he had made an agreement with our uh, president uh, at, at what was then a separately accredited college Man. to donate his papers here, and we would build an archives around those papers. And so we have um, uh, his, his papers, about 180 cubic feet 
of documents from records from Mr. Everett's uh, congressional office. He was the uh, representative from 1993 until 2009 um, for Alabama 2nd Congressional District. Uh, our, our most recent representative has been Martha Roby, and now we have um, uh, Barry Moore as as our representative. Uh, Mr. Moore was one of the, I, I'm not sure, he, he was making noises like he was going to vote against recognizing uh, the Biden presidency, but I'm not sure exactly how he voted. I stuck my fingers in my ears and I closed my eyes and I said, la, 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 la. I don't want to know how you voted on that because I have a pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not going to say any more about that. Because I, I, I want I his congressional papers too, and I don't want to shoot myself in the foot here. Hey, I feel you. I'm like, look, I don't want to know. I still want to like you, and I want, I want those papers. I'm just, let's just, I don't want to know. I don't want yeah. to so talk about it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I feel that. I feel that entirely. So I guess my question to you then is, um, you say history of archive. Uh, it's, uh, you said archiving history and whatnot. What was it? Yeah, I teach uh, historical methods, and I did teach, um, we, we had a little minor in archival management, so I taught archival all of the courses in archival management, right. First course was um, uh, was intro to archives, which included archival history, um, beginning, be, beginning with record keeping, mostly mm -hmm. among Babylonians, coming up through... Um, uh, uh, medieval record keeping, early modern record keeping, which is all very similar, uh, development of writing. Uh, then, then the change from records being, being private, um, uh, the private property of the powerful into uh, emerging as public property with the development of the nation state, principally because of the French Revolution. Um, and then, and then we teach, I taught American um, archival history, which is its own its own special thing, as well. So I I think it's safe to say you are a history buff. Ah uh, yeah yeah yeah. Is it what? Uh, well yeah, yeah I mean you have to say I don't know if I'm really a history buff. It's like asking somebody who reads for a living if they read for pleasure. You know, <laughs> I don't read for pleasure. I, I haven't read a I haven't read a book for pleasure in years. But oh I read that's what you, know? so, you mean a yeah, hustle ass that. No, I'm a professional, man. I do this for a living. So, so you know, <laughs> I got you. there's a whole bunch of history I just don't like. So <laughs> you know? Come at uh, me with uh, another thing on Gettysburg and and, and somebody's gonna get hurt. You know? <laughs> Gettysburg is what you That's what I'm what saying. Man. You. You're so a history you know? like you don't like. What history of this you don't like? You know, you hate it, you hate talking about it. Honest to God, Civil War. Civil War. And I have to talk about Civil War all the time. But I oh, don't yeah. like it. I don't, I, 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 I especially the, the military aspect of the Civil War. That's why I pick out Gettysburg. A lot of students in regular history classes. And because in, in my methods classes, I let them pick their own topics. Mm -hmm. I don't pick a topic for them. I'll, I'll help them pick a topic, but I don't pick a topic for them. Um, and invariably, I get somebody that wants to write about Gettysburg. It's like, <laughs> you cannot say anything new about Gettysburg, especially if you're an undergraduate. So find something else to talk about. And, um, uh, you know, and, and they always say the same thing. And every book I've ever read on Gettysburg, which honestly is not that many, says the same thing. I, how, I'm not trying to put down Gettysburg historians if they're really good, but there are a lot of people out there writing dreck on Gettysburg Oof. because you can make a freaking fortune on it. You know, oh, wow. there's, a, there's a market for those books. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. Hit me. It's, it's kind of a joke. It's kind of a joke among historians that if you write, among some historians, if you write a book on Gettysburg, doesn't matter if it's good or bad. You're going to sell twenty thousand copies. Wow. Okay. I just got I just got my royalty statement for the for the year 2020 for what? two books that I've written, and I don't. It, it doesn't even come to enough to take my wife out to dinner. You oh, know, wow. I am I am not 
getting that operation I always wanted based on my royalties. But yeah. by God, it's enough money that I have to report it on my taxes. So it means it that I fill out. Like you, it sounds like you might need to write you a, a Gettysburg book, man. I'm just I saying. need to write a Gettysburg book, but I'm afraid I'd have to. <laughs> I'm afraid I'd have to do damage to myself to to, to make it through writing about Gettysburg. You That's know. some torture. It sounds like you'd be torturing yourself, but I. I, yeah. I, I yeah. It's, it's, it, why is Gettysburg so pop? Why is that just the thing everyone wants to write about? I uh, well, they don't know so much want to write about it as well. I mean, my students do. I invariably get one or two students. Yeah, it's yeah. it's fascinating to a lot of people. A lot of people like military history, and a lot of times, to to many people, especially if they don't have a real appreciation of modern military history. I don't mean modern yeah. history of modern military. I'm talking about uh, uh, about contemporary views on how military history ought to be covered. I'm talking about the historiography right. of military history and historians of military history that are operating currently. Um, if you don't really understand that military history is big and broad, what a lot of people in my neck of the woods do, because they're associated with the military, they think of military history as battle history. And they've, they've gone to the battlefields, they've, they've paid attention to battle history, they're drum yeah. and trumpet historians, you know, and so as undergraduates, a lot of these folks want to write about a battle. Yeah. Well, they want to write about military operations. Um, uh, and and back when I was in, that's all it is. That, that was the thing everybody talked about was the like military operations. You know, it's all, yeah. over and over again. It's military operation and tactics, and you know how the battle was fought. You know, just military. That's all the only angle anyone would ever really seem to want to talk about. Right. And now, on, on the upside, contemporary pe people right now who deal with military history are doing an extraordinarily good job of of demonstrating that military history is much broader, much broader than a concern about the battlefield. Um, yeah. and, and I guess my first book is really kind of military history. It's um, a compendium. I'm, I was the editor. Um, uh, it's a compendium of um, essays on the home front, the Alabama home front during World War One. Okay. Um, and, 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 uh, the the life of the people. Uh, uh, I wrote I wrote a, a chapter on uh, elite white women's clubs uh, oh and my. creating creating canning factories. Uh, we have um, uh, one one chapter is on the reaction of the black church on um, uh, to uh, the declaration of war and to uh, uh, preparedness and all of that. Um, uh, see, labor that's history. all way more fascinating than the battlefield. It's yeah. like I mean, obviously, battlefield history is, is still interesting, but to me, yeah. I personally find that way more fascinating. As as do I, as do I, and so um, you know, I'm happy to read that. I'm happy to 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 uh, write it. I'm happy to direct others uh, to direct my students toward writing about that. Um, you know, a, a, a wartime era, uh, or even after the war, what kind of impact did a particular war have on the society after it? Um, yeah. And and that's that to me is excellent, excellent military history. Some really well done battlefield history is fine too, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. But undergraduates aren't going to be putting that out, and, and it becomes shallow, and it becomes something yeah. they have all. They, they already have their ideas about they're not going to get anything new about it, um, at least not in really the short gonna... time that we have together. You know, so I'd, I'd really rather them do something else. And and like I tell them, if uh, honestly, if you write about if, if you write about Gettysburg, if you write about the Cowpens, if you write if, if you write about Da Nang, um, I don't even want to hear it. You know? exactly. <laughs> just, I just don't want to hear it. Yeah. As I was saying, because it's like when you when you talk when you're talking about like the battlefield tactics, like the you know the war stuff, it's a lot more you know kind of abstract. It's a lot harder to you know really put yourself 
in the shoes and like really glean anything more about humanity and people uh, in yep. these times than you than it would be to see how it like affected you know everyone else. How did everybody else navigate during during throughout these times? Groups that were already formed, factions formed, factions that fell apart. How did you know different congregations and sects of society you know integrate, adapt to, or be crushed by? You know what I mean? The yep. wars. How? What are their reactions? Like, do you, do yep. you, you, the, a lot more human element rather than the abstract. Just you know, because war to most people is pretty abstract. They really like they can't yep. really imagine it in the, in that same way. Yeah. That they can just imagine and say, uh, well, now you got to get food rations from this place now because you know uh, the go- the government's uh, uh, commandeered everything and now we're rationing of food and you got to give give up your tires. Right whatever to the war effort or some something like that you know what i mean yeah 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 and uh, uh and now i do have to say that many many of my students uh both uh the the few that i teach on campus i don't teach much face to face i teach a lot online yeah. um and and my distance education students um are are military or military adjacent um, yeah. we, first of all, Dothan is less than 25 miles from Fort Rucker, which is the Army Aviation School, and one of yeah. those bases is named after a, a Confederate um, that is likely to have its name changed with the new uh, Defense Authorization Act. Um, yeah. But uh, but then also Troy University has a particular relationship with the military, particularly the Army. Um, and we, we have always, uh, let me just go full neoliberal on you. Um, Hit it. But, I mean, it's not, it's not me. It's what I understand our university doing. Um, hey, no problem, no problem. There, we, we have this market in that we have pursued for 40 years from the 1970s, um, with the military, we set up worldwide campuses on military bases, uh, uh, not you know, not giant campuses, but little campuses with a yeah, few yeah. rooms, and and we bring in adjuncts and and uh, teach on base. Um, we still do that in a few bases, but uh, that was a big part of our uh, of what we used to call ourselves Troy State Everywhere. Yeah. And then our first forays, particularly into um, online education was with an old program called E-Army. And, and that's really the birth of our online uh, education, is, is we hooked up with E-Army, and so it was a steady revenue stream. Now, yeah. E-Army has gone away, the military pays differently now, and so we've had some, some stumbles along the road with, that, with, with marketing. Um, but still, we've gotten this reputation, and we also offer discount discounted tuition, 50% tuition for military and uh, uh, military family uh, yeah. members to come to uh, college, which is actually a pretty good deal. Let me tell you this. I had I had a student who uh, was a retired Air Force guy, and he, he was in his 40s. Um, he was online. He was about 100 miles away from me. And when he finished his degree, his son, who was a residential student at our Troy campus, about 50 mm-hmm. miles up the road from here, they graduated the same day. Nice. Which I thought was, which I thought was very cool. And they got some discounted tuition. Each of them got discounted tuition in, in part because they were, they were military. We also, have, we also work out things with VA and, and stuff like yeah. that. So we have a lot of VA um, students usually military families here yeah i personally so, i personally utilize that myself and i good. the thing is about it i hate that i can't like i have to give up like my 911 gi bill like i it's either me or my wife use it it's one or the other but yeah. i'm just like hey why, why can't we just both use it like i like it's literally just one or the other and i'm just like i've always thought that was ridiculous you know any idea why that is? that's the way it is no i do not um this this is so far away from from what I do. Uh, in, yeah, in fact, yeah. I think if 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 I talk to the people up the road in, at the Troy campus who know how this stuff works, if I talk to our uh, financial aid people here who are really very good and they know how this stuff works, they are always m- 
just mysticized about how about the various changes that happen. Um, uh, the the big thing that's happened recently with with federal payments and not just VA, but federal payments is they they stopped for a long time paying for summer oh. classes, and now they resume paying for summer classes, which is great because we have a hard you know all colleges have a hard time making their summer classes, especially after yeah. you know with twenty twenty, and especially arts and sciences or at least the uh, the humanities and the arts do. Uh, you know, yeah, so I, there's a real business problem here. It really is. And which leads to the question, how has the pandemic affected you guys over there? Like, what are you, you doing what you do? Our campus is part of, we, we have four campuses in Alabama. We have the, uh, the original campus, uh, which is up in Troy, we have a small campus in Montgomery. We have a small campus here in Dothan. And we have an even smaller campus in Phoenix City, which is right across the river on our side of the river from, uh, uh, from Columbus, Georgia, the west side of uh, the Chattahoochee River uh, from yeah. Columbus, Georgia. And um, it has harmed our numbers. Numbers have been a little bit tough numbers of students have been a little bit tough because of, you know, college enrollments are a trailing indicator of economic health. And if you, when we went into the, the, the great recession of 2008, 2009, our numbers went up. Lots of college hmm. numbers went up because people coming out of the workforce have a little bit of money unless they're desperate and they go back to school. Well, that's why I went back to school. 1992, we were in another big recession. I had, I lost, huh, I, I lost my, I was out of work for 13 months in 1991, oh 1992. And every time I applied for a job, I was working under the table. Every time I applied for a job, um, I'd see the same five guys at the, you know, my, my, um, I was a chef and I'd see the yeah. same five, my same five colleagues who were out of work just one after another, we just apply for these same jobs. And we, we'd run into each other applying for these jobs. We'd tell each other where jobs were. Um, and it just was, you know, it's a big struggle. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I came back to school. Um, but th that kind of thing happens. People go back to school within about a year of the downturn. But if that yeah. downturn keeps going, then we've got, th then, then, people quit going to school because those people that haven't had jobs, they run out of money. And yeah. a lot of people that go to school, finish school and they don't come back. I mean, why would they? So yeah. you get a, you get a, a, a bump and then it slacks off again. We're still dealing with that because that takes about five years to really work through. And we realize ah, mm. something permanently different. Yeah. And, and so it's been slack the state has, uh, as, as with everybody, the state has been pulling back, uh, 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 cutting tuition. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. They've been cutting their appropriations. We've had to increase tuition. That shrinks the market. Um, yeah. You know, I, it, and, and it just it becomes kind of a, it becomes a, an economic vicious cycle instead of virtuous cycle. Um, and so th we've gone 10 years with this. And now, 12 years, and now we've got COVID. And let me tell you, people are staying away in droves um, from us and from everybody else. It's, a, it's common knowledge that there's going to be a, a bad shakeout in universities. A lot of little schools uh, um, are, are going to truly suffer, and that's, and that's sad. You know, particularly That's usually the, uh, what happens at times like these. Yeah. The, the schools yeah. definitely starts. The universities, the schools start getting hit the worst. Well, and I, I'm hoping that that the uh, so-called slacks, the schools of liberal arts, um, uh, are are not going to go under as much as we're afraid they will. And the HBCUs, some of which constantly struggle 
for um, uh, for money and attendance. Are yeah. You know, there's some threats there. Not the big ones, not the well-known ones. You know, I mean, Howard's not in any danger of um, of, of yeah. going under. Morehouse yeah. in any uh, any real danger, although there have been some problems there. But there are a lot of little schools all over the place that that yeah. provide education yeah. that people wouldn't get otherwise. And um, <sighs> and there's a real That's threat. That's why we should have fucking paid people to stay. Like, just pay everybody to shut down. We'll cover the difference. You just stay. Everybody shut down. Relax. Because that's all the countries did for their universities and liberal arts and all that jazz. Just like, you know, don't worry about it. Just stay home. We'll cover the cost and difference and you pay and all that jazz. Yeah. That's yeah. What we should have done. But yeah. Yep. Oh, we didn't do it. And we didn't. And, and when, we, when we stayed home to try to flatten the curve, the other half of that was supposed to be that gives us time to, to oh, yeah. develop a program possibly we develop a vaccine we never developed a program for for to, to cut down on transmission you know Ugh. protocols we never yeah. developed it as a national project crazy yeah we we straight up blew that window for sure so then i guess I, um the next question is also is like you're still reeling from what's happening with the pandemic how is everything how's everyone in your how's everything going with regards to what just happened with the insurrection like how is everybody taking that over there it's, we are, I, I, I am so literally isolated from other people that I don't talk to too many people about this kind of thing. I, let me tell you how, what I mean by isolated. It's hard to find my office. I'm in the, I'm in a back room in a, in a suite of offices next to the kitty books in the library. It's easier to find my office than it used to be. I was yeah. in the archives. You had to go through a pitch black dark room to get to my office. It really kept people away from me, which was great. Um, but, but I opened my door and I put up a stanchion and a velvet rope in front of my door. And I don't let people into my office. And people Jeez. understand to stay the hell away from me because I'm doing my best to not catch COVID, which I miserably failed at over the Christmas break. Um, and I'm absolutely yeah, positive yeah. that I had a two week dose, but, um, but be that as it may, I don't want to spread it. And th consequently, very few people. And I talk about this. I see more of my colleagues on Twitter, literally people that I'm working with. In the Twitter. same building. Uh, yeah, well, at least in the same in the same university, in talking same university, about yeah. this stuff on uh, on on Twitter. But I, honestly, I I talk to I, I work under two different deans. Uh, dean of the library is I, I have an appointment in the library, so I'm you know I'm split between two deans. And I, yeah, and I saw yeah. my library dean, and we chatted about it a little bit. And we're we're I'm not talking out of school here. We're from kind of the same end of the political spectrum. Um, yeah, which is not the same as, as many other administrators in the in the university, but uh, 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 we're both kind of stunned. Uh, this also yeah. hadn't had. I don't know what it's doing to you, but I haven't really been able to process it yet. Brother, I haven't been able to take my eyes off any and all footage uh, information I can get on it. Like literally every any. Any friggin' detail I can find, any any new information, anything I can get, I am like, I can't look away. I have when it first it was it was off. I literally I couldn't focus on my work. I couldn't focus on anything. Yeah. I was yeah. just stuck. Anything like anything I could find, I would look the live footage. I was watching the whole time, listening to the people's footage, all that. Like I I had to see every last detail of it. Anything I could find, and uh, it has I'm, consumed I'm, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I didn't do that for exact, for exact, who you or me, um, you, for you. exactly, yeah, I know for exactly that reason. It's so consuming that, that I, I'm afraid I just get information overload. So I had to kind of yeah, ration I, I, myself, uh, as to what I was looking at. Plus as a historian, and, and I got a little carried away 
uh, with, with myself on, on Twitter today. But as a historian, I, I try to get myself to back up a second. Don't listen to everything because the information's not correct yet. Yet. And yeah. Yeah, yet, yet. And, you know, you don't want to back up too far so that you lose. So, so good information drops away or gets forgotten yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, but, basically, you don't want to, we don't put on no kind of st definitive statement yet when we still, there's still so much we're learning as it's going, as it's yeah. unfolding, the more investigation reveals. Uh, yeah, and that's the key for me is what will real investigations reveal? Some of those investigations are being done by members of the news media. They're serious investigations. Of course, they're under a tight deadline, but they're yeah. not just repeating stuff. They're actually doing research, good research. Yeah. Um, and then we will get some uh, uh, more governmentally official uh, investigations Same coming up. Investigation, we yeah. better, by God, get some, in, uh, some investigations. House Oversight Committee needs to be on top of this. Senate Governmental Affairs Committee needs to be on top of this. Oh, absolutely. There's some, it appears there has been collusion. Oh, um, yeah. No, no. It, 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 all evidence so far points to it's for foul play from within. Like, yeah. Again, like I've said before, that lack of preparedness was very clearly deliberate. You know what I mean? From accounts from the people, from the police officers, the, the Capitol Police that was on the ground, yep. how they told, like, they were told, you know, uh, they were sent in un, like under equipped, even though they were you know, they, they issued certain things that they normally would keep on them. They were told not to bring it. Couldn't call for backup because for some reason, no, you know, they kept just getting denied the backup over and over. You know what I mean? It just seemed. And also, again, I ain't no conspiracy theorist, but the Sergeant <laughs> at Arms killed himself. For some reason, the guy who was in charge of uh, keeping the Senate uh, protected, yeah. for some reason, died by suicide. I, you know what I mean? So yeah. there's a yeah. lot that needs to get that needs to get investigated here. That's that. Yes, yes. These things are hypotheses right now. Some of them yes. might be correct. Some of them might be incorrect. But you know, there's there seems to be a need. To do an investigation, I think that oh, we're yeah. hearing we're we're hearing some of it. I suspect that the people who are more intimately involved in in the government, particularly the House, particularly the mm -hmm. Senate, they're hearing they're hearing things we're not hearing yet, and yeah. um, and and they will. I hope that they will put together the right questions and that they will not back away. More yeah. people died here than in Benghazi, and the House Oversight Committee uh, grilled Hillary Clinton for 11 hours in one of what appeared to be dozens of of uh, yeah. uh, 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 hearings. I think that went overboard, but because there wasn't anything there, it was obvious to make it uh, uh, to smear. It was, it was, it was political theater. It was, it was theater. Yeah, but it was right to do at least a few intense hearings on this because something went wrong. Okay, move from Benghazi to now, something yeah. went wrong. We yeah. need to have real hearings. And by God, if you get Katie Porter and her whiteboard in a... Oh, a, yeah. A, She's going to grill. Gonna uh, please, real. let her. Let her be the one grilling everybody involved. Let her do and, it. She and will the rest, tear into you. And the rest of the committee, the rest of the new House Oversight Committee are extraordinarily good even if what they're trying to do is is some theater they are extraordinarily good at uh um at at at, at drawing out information yeah. you know i'm, I'm seeing I'm, I'm looking at the comments coming in oh, and, oh so you are reading the comments yeah yeah and yeah sorry yeah. my and, bad about that jody and and yeah and i wanted to bring that to your uh uh attention that this yeah, is no, it, he, it, was the, not, the it was not the, the sergeant at arms. Yeah, it was his son, the Capitol Police officer. Just to be clear well, yeah. on that to, to anyone in the audience, that was a, a correction on there. Yes, yes, and uh, let me say something to Mr. Hubbard as well. Yes, War Eagle. Um, <laughs> roll not tide. Roll tide. <laughs> not roll tide, but but War Eagle. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have yeah. Um, I have three degrees from Auburn University and. Um, 
and I was on faculty there. So I, I tell people when I do, when I introduce myself um, at, at talks and things like that, that, hey, rain, uh, rain, rain. Hey. That I am either thrice blessed or thrice cursed, depends on whether you're an Auburn or an Alabama fan. And I, I, I guess it's kind of the same in North Carolina where you are, but the, 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 what people will ask you when, when they first meet you, um, particularly if they know you're new to Alabama, you could, you could be here for 57 seconds. They will want to know what church you go to, and they will want to know Auburn <laughs> or Alabama. And you do not have a choice. I mean, you say, you say, oh, Georgia. And it's like, well, go back. You know, you, you have no business here. You got Auburn or Alabama. Okay, Troy. Troy, to, no, Auburn or Alabama. Auburn or Alabama. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. God. Uh, you know, football is life. Uh, Ain't no, I dig it. Um, what what Because you had left Alabama in, in Oregon. What made you want to come back? Uh, it, was, it was going back to school. Um, oh, it was just that, that was just it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's why we came back. Also, um, my youngest daughter was five uh, when we decided to to move here, and my parents lived in Huntsville, and so they have not um, uh, they they didn't really know my youngest daughter, and so we also wanted to come back so they would get to know her, and my uh, uh, Mary, my youngest, and my mother, who's still alive, also Mary. Um, we're not very imaginative about names in my family um uh, uh they they actually have a very good relationship it's been 20 some odd years almost 30 years and uh they still maintain a an extraordinary relationship um oh, well, wait, uh, hey, that's but, awesome then but yeah i came back i i came back to go to school my uh, uh we we thought we had a shot at going to university of oregon and <laughs> uh, uh it turns out i did not and I was not, well, I, you know, I mean, people are accepted or they're not accepted. And I wasn't yeah, accepted. Man. They were not interested in my doctoral dissertation. And luckily, I got, I got closer to where my, um, to the main archives I needed to be at, which was in St. Augustine. So I was only six hours away rather than being completely across the country. So it worked out. Oh, yeah. Sounds like it works out in the end. Yeah, man. I mean, I mean. In my case, like I'm from Detroit, Michigan, but like the I, I settled down in North Carolina because that's where I got out. I ended my active duty the first time, and I was just like, well, I guess I'll just stay here because I, 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 I ain't nothing for me back in Michigan. It's too cold. I don't yeah. want to stay northern cold, brother. And my wife and I had that conversation this morning um, when it's it. We got a little cold snap yesterday and today and it's been it's been mm. that that really wet cold that you get in the south that uh is, yeah it's yucky yeah yeah and yeah. so we we both we're both are like ah we've gotten to be so southern we we have no desire to to i mean we'd both like to go back to oregon we'd like to live in the portland area but it's too expensive and too cold uh, too, that's basically the same thing you know, in michigan you know. too expensive and too cold uh, Jody here in Pierre News asking because you, you already told me, but he he had missed out. What, what was your specific focus in history? Uh, yeah, my um, uh, my current my current focus in history, which is kind of opportunistic, is um, uh, U.S. Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And, it was a uh, Progressive uh, Era. I, for, I mean, I, did I oh, miss yeah, something? Capital P, Capital P Progressive, not Little P <laughs> Progressive. We're we're talking uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson. William Howard Taft, you know, from about 1900, 1890 to, uh, uh, to maybe 1920, I maintain that the progressive era has extremely long legs and that we are doing, we, we are still experiencing uh, many of the changes that occurred. And the, the mm -hmm. most important change to me that occurred was, um, uh, was that the, the gist of the progressive era was for the U.S. managerial middle class and petty bourgeois middle class to establish itself as the political, social, and cultural hegemon in, in the United States to, to carve out a place, but also to, um, for themselves, but also to establish their hegemony, their suzerainty, they got to define what I mean, they, me, we got to define um, what the good life was, how people should behave, 
what is the relationship between the individual in our political system and society in, in our political yeah. system. We also, um, the, this managerial middle class determined that that labor would be would be disciplined and that not so much capital but capitalists would be disciplined and they would have to behave themselves. They could not be, as Michael McGurr says, toxically individualistic. <laughs> and the mutualism of well, yeah, and that failed. That failed. That failed, that, that failed miserably <laughs> in the new Gilded Age. You know that, and that right. failed. But that's that's the struggle that that defines the 20th century. I also tend to look at yeah. uh, the development of knowledge professions. I mean, you know, going okay. back to what do I study? I look at knowledge professions as well. So what's that? What is knowledge professions? How do you commercialize, meaning how do you get paid for disseminating knowledge, for ah, developing okay. expertise? How did, okay, there are four great professions, right? Four classic yeah. professions. College professors, um, doctors, lawyers, priests, and preachers. But now... The whole 20th century has been about how do these do these middle class of knowledge workers get paid for being a middle class of knowledge workers? Social work, um, management, engineering. So the development of expertise. Here's another one: archivists. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't a profession of archivy prior to the 20th century, really. Prior to prior yeah. to the 1890s, there was nobody that made their living identifying, preserving, and and making available for research um, uh, unique historical materials, records yeah. of you know records of uh, of enduring value, which is this is archival jargon. We're getting this out of books. No, but I um, get you. I got a question here on that. Now, how do you? What is your take on like how? that's manifested in the age of the internet. Because like now, I don't know if you've ever seen stuff like that, but like people literally kind of make a living on YouTube, basically disseminating information on things from obscure things like video games to just, yeah. re you, know, you know what I mean? Does that also count as a knowledge profession? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, professions, that's a knowledge occupation. Professions, knowledge occupation, yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of sociological um, discussion about how you define what a profession is and how professionals define themselves. In the early 20th century, they used a medical model that came out of a study that was done by a, a guy named uh, uh, Abraham Flexner in 1912. And he said, the medical profession has these characteristics. They have yeah. a body of arcane knowledge. That knowledge is is passed on by um, uh, 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 by by education, generally college education. We have uh, doctors have a code of ethics that they that they they aren't in it for the transaction; they're in yeah. it for the service, and they have a code of ethics about what service means, how to define that, and that's what they sell. They sell the service. They don't. And they sell what they know. I used yeah, to have a chef. Yeah. I used to have a, a chef I worked for who um, um, we used to, to tease him kind of brutally about uh, <laughs> never getting his his chef's coat dirty. I mean, we'd be splashed with everything on the line, uh, and he would he'd get a, a smudge and go change his uh, uh, go change his chef's coat. And so we talked teased him mercilessly about that, and he said, you know. I don't get paid for what I do. I get paid for what I know how to do. And, and he's right on. That is a knowledge profession. Knowledge occupations, new ones, will they become professions? I don't know. Um, yeah. Because it's like there's no defined it's standard of how to do that in, right, in the, right. the internet. It's, it's just it's kind of like the wild west right now. There, there was no defined there was no defined way to do this in the early 20th century. You had to convince your market that it was worth their time to pay you. 
And in fact, my doctoral dissertation is on how American chefs as managers chose yeah. to create a professional organization to promote what they did as a knowledge profession rather than take a shorter route to protecting their income by unionizing. They chose not to unionize because it defined them as working class. And they wanted to be, um, they wanted to be identified as the upper middle class. As the managerial class. As managerial like middle class. Profession. Yep. Yeah. As a knowledge profession. Yep. You know, that's fascinating. I can imagine. I can almost imagine, like, I guess, because many of the people who disseminate information on, like, the history of a certain video game or media product and whatnot coming out doing that, being like, hey, you know, this is not, you know, I'm trying to make it like a more officiated profession, you know, a standard of ethics yeah. when doing that. And I'm like, that is, I don't know, it's just so much like the way, because the way the internet has basically opened that up to effectively everyone now. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I well, can and, see and something like that happening. We're living through that same, the, yes, we're living through a new period based on, ba based on the ability of the internet to give us a, a easy startup. Exactly what people in the early, uh, late 19th and early 20th century, this middle class of managers and middle, uh, this petty bourgeoisie of independent contractors and managers were doing then. They, they had newspapers and magazines. The penny press started in the 1890s, and magazines were the blogs of their day. Okay? <laughs> magazines didn't, didn't exist in the kind of, of um, critical mass before 1890 that they did after about 1900, 1910. Albany, Maine, uh, Albany, Albany, Augusta, Augusta, Maine had so published so many magazines that they built a post office just to handle the magazine trade coming out of Augusta. Wow. Yeah. They published 17 magazines. This was um, 19. This was basically written by just paper blogs. Yeah. Yeah. They published 17 magazines, and, and each of those magazines had millions of subscribers. And so wow. they were, the, the, the post office couldn't handle the traffic, so they built a post office just for the magazine trade. There's a pretty good website on this. I haven't looked at it in a long time. I haven't thought about it in a long time. But if you look up Augusta and magazines, um, a, um, I, gosh, I cannot remember the, the, the lady's name that uh, created this website. I think she was a, a graduate student, a doctoral student working on some of these mm -hmm. things. But um, uh, Comfort Magazine, the only reason I know this is that, that we received in my archives a, um, about three dozen um, of these newspaper-like magazines that a fella's um, uh, mother had subscribed to. And yeah. I normally wouldn't have accepted that, but it was controllable. It was small. It was, uh, it was easy to handle and it was pretty interesting. And so in doing mm -hmm. some background research, but that's been 10 years. And so, so I don't really remember my background research from that and not thinking mm -hmm. about it. I haven't looked it up uh, recently, but yeah, yeah. So anyway, that they is. were doing that stuff. Journalists became professionalized during that period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody had a trade journal um, during that period of time. Uh, they may not have been long lived. Everybody tried to, to, to create themselves as a recognized profession. And there's nobody that says, we anoint you a profession. Yeah. It, you just kind of had to, through popularity, through recognized, you know, that, that the amount of people that subscribe to you, to your work, it, it, effectively that kind of makes you then an authority on it. I mean, enough people like what I have to say, so therefore I, you know, I get to be the one to decide what's right. the standard. Clearly what I'm doing works, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, currently it doesn't appear that you're, that you've monetized this much, uh, but if you were to make a full-time living at it, 
then how would you how would you consider yourself? And then other people, you would get together with other people who considered themselves to be doing the same thing. How would you transfer the knowledge of how to do the task? What is the goal of the task um, of of this information that you're passing along? What is your business model? And do other people um, agree to model themselves after you? Or, Basically, or is that wide or is that narrow? Do you have um, a standard of ethics? Do you guys get together and say, okay, listen, we need a code of ethics that we all agree to uh, abide by? And yeah, there may or may not currently be- is. It is pretty much just the wild west. We're all just yep. making this shit up as we go. Like everyone is just making it up as we go. And that's how it happens at the beginning. That is the Wild West. I call that the heroic era of um, ah. not because not because people are heroes, but because they are in an era when when you, you you don't have any rules to follow. You do make it up as you go along, and and some people try to uh, 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 to to behave ethically. You know, applying a a set of ethics from over here to their situation yeah. over here. Um, and some people behave unethically. Um, oh, yeah. And some people see the world differently than each other. I'm not talking about ethics here. I'm talking about in what is the goal? What should the what should it look like? What you know? I mean, okay. Let me give you an example. Room no, Raider. I, I get you. I trust me. I get you. We keep going. Okay. Room Raider. Room Raider is driving how people create the backgrounds for these kinds of chats. Oh, it's driving it. And I'll tell you why I know that because it's doing it to me. And <laughs> I'm, I'm falling to, I'm, I'm falling into a pattern. I think about the yep. background. I think about mm-hmm. cord violations. One of the reasons I came to my office rather than be, than working out at home is because I wasn't sure of the lighting at home. I'm yeah. sure of the lighting in my office. Also, look behind me. I have stuff on the wall and I've got books. This is what a professor's office looks like. Yeah. You know? And you, you didn't set that standard of how the, a professor's office looks like. Somebody else did who a, yeah. a collection of perfect what, what what became to be professors or the standard of what what well, professor's office should look like, and right. as, as well as also with the as a on a on a video call of you know yeah. Yeah. you got a, a standard to a standard to uphold. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a, it's the same kind of thing that you do when you walk into a class. Um, you know, students have an expectation of what the professor looks like, and yeah. um, uh, 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 men and women, you know. Um, uh, and 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 non-binary people, regardless of of their gender or sex or or you know mishmash we, of all of that, definitely still people have an idea. Idea, yeah. you know, we're still developing that currently. You know what I mean? We're in yeah. uncharted territories, and we're we're currently charting those territories. And that's what you guys are doing in this kind of um, uh, uh, this kind of endeavor, the kind of of interview endeavor uh, that you're doing. Right now, you're you're yeah. making it up. You're trying to find out what works. Uh, you're trying to find Basically. out what people want. And uh, and and some a, a lot of y'all will will do this for a little while, and then you go do something else because it no longer works for you, yeah. or the medium yeah. or the medium is no longer um, uh, satisfactory. But some people stay. There are still bloggers. There are still you know. Um, I've, I've got a couple of blogs that I manage and, and I yeah, don't do yeah. it often, but there is a market, yeah. you know, for well, that. The, the, um, the beauty but, of the internet and with that is it, it opened that up to everyone because mm-hmm. they say once upon a time, I'm sure you know, this is what knows way far better than I ever, I do. You know what I mean? With regards to like those magazines, as an example, not everybody could write for those magazines. Right. You know what I mean? But now within the advent of the internet, everybody can have, anyone can have a blog. 
Anybody could have a little talk show. Anybody yeah. could have, like, literally just, you throw a little money into the equipment or whatever you need to do it, and bam, you're your you're own fucking photo, your own journalist, your own blogger, your own, you know, news outlet. Honestly, you effectively open it up to everybody, and that, yeah, we're in... <laughs> This is uncharted territories as a result because right. you find people who are extremely unethical, who glad who um, who've made a killing out of doing this. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like people like Tim Pool who are just, um, oh, yeah, he's a prime example of everything. Who is guilty of everything he accuses the mainstream media of being guilty of of being unethical yeah. uh, and misinforming people and sensationalizing and yada yada yada. You know what I mean? So you got on the, in the, in the independent side here with the accessibility to everybody. There are people who you, you as example, but it, obviously it works for them. It's catering yeah. to a certain audience that wants that anyways. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's right. So it's a matter of you know def- developing the ethics and the morality of what we're doing. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, it works, but it's wrong what he's doing. And how do you quote unquote enforce that? body of ethics with people who won't necessarily agree to it you know yeah. i mean and you he's, don't he's have accountable to, put, to effectively no one so you know exactly exactly um and and knowledge professions unless there's licensure have the same issue for example uh the uh, uh, american historical association organization of american historians two distinct organizations have similar codes of ethics but there's no enforcement mechanism yeah, you know, all you can do, the worst that can happen is that they no longer accept you as a member. I just thought, you know? I imagine I had to get, a, I had to be a license to be a YouTuber. Just the thought of that. Yeah, <laughs> gotta get, yeah. You gotta get a license for that first. And they revoked my license because I said I did something wrong. Yeah. Well, you know, there's always a pressure group that wants to uh, create licensure in order to create a barrier enforce. to entry yeah well not yeah. just enforce but create a barrier to create entry, barrier to entry yeah. uh yeah and and the beauty of the internet and this is what i tell my students the beauty of the internet is that the um uh, um uh, uh, the 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 barriers to entry are so low that as you said earlier anybody can have a blog anybody can have one of these talk shows anybody can have a youtube channel um you know just about anybody can have a uh, 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 a SoundCloud, a, uh, a yeah, podcast. Yeah, literally, literally anybody yeah. at this point. Like if you all you yep. if you have just a little bit of money, like I, like here, just using this stream yard, this little thing that I'm using, this is free. Yeah, this is this is free. Yeah, you know what I yeah. mean. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I've run into. I, I run a little podcast for the Alabama Historical Association, and we have accumulated since 2012 enough um, uh, uh, tape, enough uh, 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 audio that um, that we have to pay for storage. But it's 167 bucks a year, you know, for unlimited storage. So, you know, well, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people can never you. come that's up with that. Bad. But yeah, yeah. But in the in the real world, not everybody has that money. But yeah. you can get a couple hours of um, of free SoundCloud, you know, and 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 run your RSS uh, that way, and just just recycle your uh, your your free SoundCloud. So yeah, this is this is the Wild West. Um, there will come a time when when people will say we start ha- we have to have an ethics. Uh, uh, component uh or else we won't recognize you as a youtuber uh we yeah. have to have uh, uh, the the state of x has to license you or else we yeah. won't recognize you um you oh know. god yeah that's good that's coming oh god it's gonna come in due time it is it will it will come it's enough it's only a matter of time it's, it's gonna be i would say like an independent journalist board of ethics we're just like yeah no if you're gonna be some little indie youtube journalist guy or whatever they would like disseminate information news current events whatever you know you hear you, you gotta follow these board heads or you and if, you know if we don't recognize if you're not certified you know basically you know we're gonna make sure people know everybody's gonna know yeah. that you're not sorry you're just some dude who did? Who got denied certification, or you just don't have one and didn't, don't bother to get one, or you can't do it without one, and we can have you shut down until you get one. 
or or even if we just uh, squeeze you a little bit, we move you over to to this section. You're cut out of the algorithm that. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Until you get certified. Recommends. Yeah. 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 Oh God. Uh, oh my God. I didn't even think about all that. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, a matter coming. of time. It's coming. It's coming. But how easy? Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this because I think it's funny. How easy is it to to get involved in something like what you're doing? It's so easy that years ago, when she was nine years old, my granddaughter created a YouTube channel, and all she did was 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 make YouTubes with a phone um, about putting on makeup. And she's really good at putting on makeup. This nine-year-old kid was just performing. You know, I mean, we so have make, we have. We have very popular makeup YouTubers like that. That's just their, that's literally their thing. They just yeah. they just put on they just try on different makeup. Yeah. That's literally it. That's it. That's all they do. I and I get that. I I I understand why that's popular. I really yeah, I, do. You know what I'm saying? So it's like there's a niche out there for everybody. I'm, I'm not is. exaggerating. You will find li anything you can think of. There is a niche out there for the internet. Open the door. Open the floodgates. For everyone, any for every, no matter how hyper specific that niche yep. is, yep. I yep. guarantee there is a pocket of the internet it's there for, like right, just right there. You know, my friend Joey, he's we put. Oh, no, sorry, what? Oh, I was just gonna the, the, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. You first. You first. Okay, I, I was just gonna say that, uh, and that's the beauty of all of this. Is it? Yeah. Is 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 anybody can get started, and there's always somebody that is going to watch you. Somebody is going to fall just crazy in love with what you're doing. It's it's great. It's great. I, there are downsides to that, but who cares? What about? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's way too late. That that Pandora's box is open. Ain't no un, ain't no closing this. It's right. way too late. And the best we can do now is enforce uh, enforcement of such kind of like like the, those regulations, the, the regulatory boards built of yeah. the ethics of the specific thing that you do. You know what I mean? To yeah. better regulate the the worst, the, the double edged access, uh, 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 fucking aspect of this. Like yeah. I said, the the misinformation peddlers who don't adhere to any ethics whatsoever. Yeah. You yep. know what I mean? You know, yep. kicking them off the algorithm because, hey, you know, y'all, y'all, y'all put out nothing but bad information. You don't follow any kind of ethical standards, so goodbye. Right. You know what I mean? That would be the only way to. Oh my God! <laughs> I didn't think of any of that. And who is That's the, the solution? That? Well, it could be. And who is the? I, I, you know, who is the solution? I mean, it could be anyone really, but a, a collective enough effort of people who I would, I would like to think. Uh, uh, adhere to the best practices, you know, the ones that have the best results and the less harm done to people would be the ones yeah. who collectively make that decision. Because if we well, had ethics boards decided by, oh, keep going. Oh, I was going to say, and as Imperial News is saying at 529 in the chat, um, that uh, uh, terms of service exist. And these terms of service are, uh, uh, that they're the beginning of this. Oh, they're that. You, yeah, that's the start. Yeah, yeah, that's the start. That's the start. I, I, can I take a second and ask, uh, answer this question from uh, 509? Oh, yeah, uh, this, let's see, is it this one? I can't, I can't make it come up. Oh, yeah. yeah I is can. it this one? It's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, goodness. Well, I wasn't prepared for this exactly, but uh, um, <laughs> a couple of a couple of books. One uh, that I would recommend. Why am I not seeing my books? Doggone it. Oh, here it is. Yeah, here they are. Here's, uh, here's Hofstadter, which is uh, what uh, this question is asking about. One of Hofstadter's books. And, okay, the historiography is, uh, has gone a little bit past Hofstadter now. But the, the books I use for my um, uh, class, that my senior level class that covers uh, this uh, era uh, are these. I use New Spirits by Rebecca Edwards. Uh, New Spirits, uh, Americans in the Gilded Age, 1865 to 1905. But I particularly like Michael McGurr's 
MCGERR's uh, Fierce Discontent, which covers from about 1885 to about 1920, 1870 to about 1920. And he's where I have picked up this idea that um, um, that a lot of the progressive era was about creating um, uh, creating the space for the middle class and the exertion of cultural hegemony um, by the middle class uh, and, and <laughs> turning everybody in the United States into some, some broad version of the, the middle class life, yeah. you know, having everybody. And if you don't live a middle class life, you're cut off. You're somehow bad. You're, you, you're doing it wrong. You know, whether yeah. you're, but whether you don't have enough money to live a middle class life or whether you're spending ostentatiously, we punish both of those ends. We punish the poor worse, but we, we ostracize the, um, the rich, the ones who live the, the, the exact, ugly, extravagant, the, the, or we elect them president, one or the other. Oh, you know? oh yeah, honestly. I would you say know, now the the lines of the those ideal those idealized versions of how things should be have I would think and say maybe I'm wrong but by and large pretty 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 much destroyed the idea of what is supposed what you the way you're supposed to live at certain income brackets and whatnot you know what I mean given that it's um because it's like, what is the middle class? When someone said the middle class is like making 100K a year, it's just like, I, who's making 100K a year? Oh, you know what I mean? How oh. many people are actually making that much right now? And honestly. Yeah, yeah I, you know I, I, mean? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> hell, I certainly am not. So, you know uh, what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's, it's uh, that line we have to redefine what is the what, what quality of life and you know if it's attainable, because I'm like for me, if I had to measure the health of the the health of the country, I would measure it on the fact that you know more than literally, I think the number when I when I did my research was like eighty percent of the country is one missed paycheck away from poverty. You know what I mean? I've, I've heard of to me that's a you know what I mean. I'm like to me that's a bad fucking sign. That I'm like uh, maybe there isn't a middle class if eighty percent of the country is yeah. one missed paycheck away from poverty. But that's how cultural hegemony works. People who are one paycheck away from falling uh, 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 below a certain level of income, for having serious problems, for, for becoming homeless, that, and they still identify themselves as the middle class, that's the essence of hegemony. We talked them into, over the course of the century, we talked their great-grandparents, their grandparents, their... Um, uh, uh, themselves, their kids, into defining themselves as middle class if they have this, 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 and this. I tell you, yeah. my grandfather, my grandfather and grandmother were were working class, completely working class. Completely, yeah. I mean, they. Uh, uh, my grandfather turned wrenches. He was a union man in Montgomery, Alabama. He was. A, he's a pipe fitter, a union man, and I guarantee you, he was a member of the Klan. <laughs> Those two things are not exclusive. The, it, in Alabama, it's not one or the other. A lot of times, yeah. it's both. Um, and and my father um, became literally a rocket scientist, a chemical engineer who helped, who who designed rocket motors. And one of their projects was went on for 15 years before Congress almost cut them off. So they proposed a new project, which was the old project with a new name that became the Patriot Missile. So oh, dad, dad worked for a defense contractor, but um, uh, Thicol. And so he became middle class. He, he was more middle class than my mother, who was born into it. Dad yeah. defined himself as middle class by God. Um, right. And he defined gotcha, his gotcha. children as middle class by God. For example, there was absolutely no not going to college in my house. Yeah. You that's know? A, that is a, defi a defining feature of middle, being middle class going to college. That's, yep, yep. Being got able to it, defer the it. income and being able to, um, uh, to pay to go is a defining yeah. characteristic 
of um, of the middle class. Um, all right. That's what I tell yeah, my no, students. And, and it makes them crazy because they all think of themselves as they don't really understand themselves as middle class. It's, kind of, say, it's but, harder to see ourselves like that when those the uh, those milestones are harder and harder to achieve. Yep. It's just it we're like by the point that we were told we're supposed to have achieved them by. So now yep. everything kind of just blends together in such a way where it's just like we don't know where those milestones are anymore. I have no I, I have no idea. I'm 26, you know what I mean? All I have is an associates in the general studies, man. Like but yeah, that's I served in the military. I, 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 I should have had it earlier, but I, I kind of didn't. No, 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 no. And, and now the economy is so screwed up. How can you get it earlier? You know? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's really yeah. hard to define that now. That's, yes. well, that, that's, that's what it is. A, a lot of people can consider ourselves like to be the, like the lost generation because we just we really don't know. You know what I mean? It's just, just don't know anymore. My idea is this, that, that, that in the immediate post-war period, the, the beginning of the baby boom, yeah. and, and I'm a boomer, I was born in 55, so I'm in the dead center of the baby boom. But um, um, that era from 1944 until maybe about 1973, yeah. that era is the aberration. Not because it was the baby boom, but because of the economy. That era yeah. that everybody wants to to say, oh, that's common. Everybody, the 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 ideals of that era. You can go to college. You can have a house. You can have uh, uh, three, uh, you know, two point three five children. Yeah. Uh, that whole thing, and that there is. Uh, and then by forty, you can have your midlife crisis, and then you yeah. get over it. <laughs> then you have a retirement. We say that's normal for American history. That's total bullshit. That's an aberration. <laughs> that's an aberration. What I lived through is the aberration. It was a good aberration for me. But an aberration, though. It but was not the standard at all what, anywhere. That's right. What you guys are living through is much is, is really what American history is, is, has been about. Uh, you know, wow. we're still aspirational. And it's the first I've heard that. We want. You know, you guys want to, uh, uh, your generation wants to have these things, but how to get them is just out of reach. But it's that aspiration that's really the American dream. The yeah. people that were outside of that were the ones who got to get the American dream. And the mistakes that we made was thinking that this would never freaking change. Yeah. You know? That, yeah. And it, it, it yeah. built on the idea that it that this would never that it would never end and it would never change, but it it did, would and never end. Would... And by 1973, which is the year I went to college, I was 18 in 1973. We should have known that it would have ended, and we elected yeah. people. Yeah. We elected people who, <laughs> and I have to say, after 1980, because don't blame me for 1980. I was 25 I years I, old. Yeah, you know, I ain't blaming you not knowing a damn thing. But um, um, but you can blame me for me and mine for eighty four and, and and on. Although I voted right, um, we we boomers allowed the worst of us to gain power, and I hope that that millennials and Gen X or uh, uh, Gen Y, Gen Z, yeah, yeah, don't. Do that. Uh, let me be an old yeah. man for a minute. Let me be a crotchety old bastard for a hey, minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. We made a damn mistake. We thought we were all counterculture. We thought that that peace, love, and and dove, and sex, drugs, and rock and roll was was what all of us wanted and what made for the good life. Well, it did make for the good life. They did. <laughs> but what we what we did was to allow people who didn't believe that, who yep. only believed in wanting the good things for themselves, the Studio 54 crowd, the crowd that hung with Epstein, all of yep. that kind of person to say, I can get political power because these idiots aren't watching. Even those of us 
who were in the new left. We stopped watching. We said, wait a minute, electoral politics is bullshit. And we don't want to be involved in this. We'll go, we'll go into the streets, but we don't want to be involved in this. And most of us said, yeah. we just don't want to, you know, politics sucks. And, yeah. and no mm. one wants to do it. You know, we just want to live life. That's what, live in the moment, all of that. The worst among us. We allowed them. They, they took advantage of that. They happily. And it's happening to y'all. Look yep. at the look. Look at the pictures of the people who are at the MAGA. Look at the pictures of MAGA. Yeah, you'll see people like me, but you'll see people like you, too. Yeah. And there are lots of people like you. The good thing about people like me, we're dying off. <laughs> you guys are going to be here for a while. Yep. Don't let those sons of bitches. Generation. Don't let those sons of bitches take over, because they will Fuck do it. No. Stephen Miller is not a boomer. No, God, he's Josh not even. Josh Paul is me. not a boomer. <laughs> Matt These Gates guys are not, not boomers. boomers. Ted, uh, 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 Ted Cruz, I don't know what he is. Who cares? Um, <laughs> I think he's Gen X. But uh, 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 Tom Cotton, not a boomer. These no. men are. Dangerous, dangerous, and uh, and they're not boomers. So y'all are just as infested as we were, and yeah. the same thing will happen to the same thing will happen to your children as what we allowed to happen to our children. Who are you? We were Do wrong. Me. Do Don't me know. Be hey. make your own stupid mistakes. Don't make our stupid mistakes. Gotcha. Hey, well, it's just, it seems this is the most politically engaged youth has ever been, and, and aware, aware and engaged we've ever been. And it's only yeah. getting, it's only growing, especially in the advent of these pivotal moments of like from Trump getting elected to a fucking insurrection that just happened. Or we'll call a Congress nearly got fucking slaughtered. So you know things like that kind of snaps people into focus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 for and for the previous generation, the AIDS epidemic did the AIDS epidemic yeah. was to the previous yeah. generation what what in my generation was the threat of atomic annihilation yeah. you know and and uh and you guys got your own weird ass shit going on uh, you know that we have put on top of you it's crazy it's a lot we, we were wrong it's a man. lot yeah it's a lot it's it's uh, it's frustrating disheartening and it doesn't help that like, internet is a double-edged sword in that matter because it never ends. It just seems like it's just a never-ending stream of shit. And it just, it, it, it definitely breaks down the I don't think our brains were meant for this never-ending flow of information, the, a bad information, no less. Yep. You know what I mean? Just every single day, nonstop, like the 24, I, like I joked about it. I'm like, can this, can we make, instead of a 24-7 news cycle, can it just be like, you know, Three, seven news cycle. Like, I don't know. Just, can we like slow down? Can the world slow down for five fucking seconds, please? Like, can we just dial it back a bit? Because this is just so much at once that is genuinely. And like, I do this sort of for fun slash living. You know, not, not a living, but like, you know, just because I want to inform, to, to keep people informed and engage with people. But this shit is exhausting. I can see why oh, yeah. people. I can see why people tune it out. I can see yep. why people get disillusioned or disengaged because it's a lot. Yeah. 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 And, and I can't speak for the generations before mine and after mine, but I can tell you that the same shit was hitting the fan, a different style of shit, but the same amount of shit certainly felt like it was hitting the fan when I was about your age. And, um, and, and, and previously, um, and, and it became so exhausting that again, we just let our, uh, the worst among us take over because we didn't want to yeah. do those jobs. Yeah. We didn't want to run for Congress. So we let the worst among us yeah. take over. It's, yeah, let it, them, and, we, and, that's, and that's the result. We let them to fill the spot. Cause I, I try to tell people is like, I'm like, it's, I've always wondered like why, and I know why in a lot of ways that accessibility is and all this to cause not just a matter of a lack of interest, but it was also because right. people were effectively priced out and before the internet crowdfunding to be able to be able to afford to get involved was not at all easy or the, right. you, know, you know just it was just so much harder to do so i can understand why you're just like i'm not getting it because it's just the, the sheer scale of what you had to do to get involved in politics back then 
it, 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 I can see why it even felt insurmountable back then. But now, it's actually, again, it's going to still fuck the way things are, but it's a lot more accessible now than it was back then to influence the culture, to get involved in politics, mm-hmm. all that. And that's exactly right. And that's, uh, uh, that, as exhausting as it is for you, it might actually be easier for every voice to make a dent, yeah. you know, now, because they can make a dent in mass, like in the street, they can make a dent at the voting booth, and they yeah. can make a dent in doing the kind of thing that in, in individuals communicating uh, uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and information flow. Yeah. But if this makes you feel any worse, when I, when, when my family first got a television, news was 15 minutes long. What? One newscast a day, 15 minutes. That oh. was it. Can we go back to that? Can we well, 15 minute one newscast? Just one? On the same. Yeah, oh, and there were only three God. channels. <laughs> there were only three channels. And, and the kids were the remotes. Get up and go change the channel, will you? You know, get up and go change the channel. Get up and go change the channel. Um, I, it's kind of a joke, but it's really true. It's based in truth. Um, but you know what happened? You know what, what made news longer was the Vietnam War and, yeah. and, and television cameras on the battlefield. Uh, so now we're circling Ooh. back to our earlier conversation about battlefield history. But I remember seeing pictures of the wounded and dying videos of the wounded and dying at dinner on at the dinner table watching tv while eating dinner that threw a huge wedge between my father and myself Ah. a big ideological wedge between dad and me that was very difficult to overcome yeah it's very difficult to overcome it and i would say it's in I would say the equivalent moment to that right now, like I said, for against this generation, is things like um, you know the at least I would say just again recent events. If there's anything that's driven a wedge between people, and that really, like I said, just a modern example is that insurrection. If, oh yeah. If you didn't have, if you weren't clear on what your ideology was before, this definitely drew that line. Now, for anyone oh, yeah. that saw it, paid attention, know what happened. It's just like. Like it's just it's just basically you either support the insurrection or you're opposed to it, and no. if you, you, you it, and it's, it's and that's a huge like that's like that's a kind of a deal breaker for people there stuff like mm-hmm. that it's just like hold on now you know what I mean it's kind of a this ain't something you can just shrug off you know what I mean Absolutely. this it's, is where that this is so where those big. wedges get drawn yes it's too big it's so it's too big. big you have to make a decision. You have to come down on one side or another. There are going to be a small number of people that that refuse to make a decision about it, but most people will come down either in support or against. Yeah, that's it's, it. That's it's a it. And you, it's yeah. a defining moment of your character and your ideals, and a lot of people aren't comfortable facing that. Is what I've realized. Is that's why people typically try to stay indifferent or apolitical, whatever. Just don't like talking about it because that means you have to ask some very uncomfortable questions, not just towards yourself but the people around you that you probably like or love, you know, some very, you, you might learn some things about them that you didn't know and you didn't yeah. want to know. Right. 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 Absolutely. So, wow. Yeah, that's, that's what this has. Yeah. That's what stuff like that has made me realize. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and you're absolutely right about it. You're absolutely right. But keep those, keep those good thoughts going because they will help guide you into the future. Your, your future is before you, and, uh, I'm and trying, you're going to have a, I'm trying. you're going to have a bunch of responsibility for the way the world works, and and uh, yeah, I know. I it sucks, just, man, man. I, I just want to get high and play video games. You know, live long <laughs> and pro- I just want to chill. Like, yeah. why can't the world just not be on fire? Like, why can't people just be good? Yeah, you know, there are no greedy politicians. You know, all that. Just like, can we all just Relax. Like, I don't want to have to. I don't want the world on my shoulders. I want to relax, but I don't get to. I know I have to. I, I have a because yep. I like I have an, a, a responsibility to people because I know I know better. I know the truth. I know what that's like. I know the scale of it. 
And it'd be an irresponsible of me and incredibly selfish of me to pretend like I don't. And I, my, my own guilty fucking conscience won't let me pretend like I won't. So I yep. can't chill as much as I'd like to. <laughs> Ugh, I am yeah. like, why can't the why can't they just be okay? Like, why do I have to care so much? Why am I not uh, a sociopath? Why am I not why, a sociopath? I, yeah. I wonder about this. I'm like, man, life must be so easy for so for people like that, you know? They yeah. don't just they don't care about anybody or anything. Yeah. Like, like they must just breeze through life. Yeah, that's a, that's easy to say, but but you know that works on your soul too bad. Yeah, no, my pay, heart can't you, take you it. Pay I, soul, you're paying your soul for that. Yeah, and I, I, so I like having, as, as frustrating as it is, I like having a soul. As annoying yeah. as the damn thing is, I like having one. Yeah. A healthy, yeah. happy soul that cares about people. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and it drives you to good, so with do, that, do though, good work. Yeah. It does, it does. But now I'll say that we have been here for actually well over an hour. It's usually just oh, an yeah. hour long, but honestly, be, my people canceled, so it's just you and me. And as much as I, it, it, I, I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying the conversation. Me too. Me too. I had no but, idea what we were going to talk about when we got here. But, uh, I decided I do it from the. I, it's all off the cuff for me. I literally just, yeah. I, will, I bring him on and get. And once you get the ball rolling, that you, the conversation just kind of naturally flow. Yeah, yeah, and and you're doing but, a great job. So. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's what I say, but I would like to wrap it up. So I'm going to say to the audience. Um, I have one last talk tonight at 9.30, so if you guys will be there, cool. If not, cool. But thank you all for sticking me with me throughout the day. And again, I love the audience engagement. I love talking to people. And Marty, seriously, thank you for coming, for real. It was a pleasure. And you're welcome on any time. I have you a guest. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. Do you have any closing statements for the for the audience? Do you have anything last statements for the audience? A little message? I, 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 hope, I, I hope we made sense. I hope it was worth your while. It's certainly been worth my while um, uh, to do this, and I hope to re-engage with you at, uh, at, at sometime in the future. Absolutely. There's always, there's always stuff to talk about, brother. There's, oh, yeah. <laughs> there ain't no shortage of things to talk about. <laughs> Very so, true. With that, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. You all have a great night. <laughs>